Issue 154. We start out with a sandstorm separating Sonic from the children he saved in the microverse. For some reason he passes out because of it instead of creating a tornado with a super speed or some sort of wind cocoon to get the sand away from him. And so people decide to make him a slave when they find him unconscious in the desert. He wakes up in a slave cell a short time later and he runs through the wall at Sonic's feet to punch through it as reality ensues. Immediately Sonic gets punched and threatened by a muscular two-headed man. With the other head, his brother, lampshading how he's wasting time talking to him instead of smacking him right away. I like it that it's lampshaded because this happens way too many times in comic books. The Slave Master misses his sword swing, but hits him with the club that for some reason has him steaming afterwards. Then the two brothers start to argue with each other, and since they're too well armed to attack directly, Sonic creates a tornado of sand around them, making them motion sick and quit. One of them says that a villain named Curse had told them slaves would be easy to handle. Right away, Curse the Sorcerer shows up with stilted dialogue like a little kid, and he reveals that the reason the muscular two-headed man is considered two people is because the Sorcerer had merged two brothers into one man to make him. That makes a lot more sense since they're considered brothers. Sonic gets imprisoned in a tight cage made of rock spikes from below. Sonic tells the slave driver that if he helps him escape, he'll get the wizard to reverse the spell on him. Not sure how he expects him to do that for a guy he hates. He frees Sonic with his hammer and gets hit with a painful spell. Sonic hits Curse with a spin dash, satisfyingly interrupting the annoying, arbitrarily rhyming spells, and he says that his spells aren't much use against a guy who can move faster than he can speak, with reality ensuing once again. The Sorcerer surprisingly admits defeat after one hit to the chest. He can dish it out, but he sure can't take it. And he says that he's yours to command, realizing that Sonic's reasoning is right. The Sorcerer reverses the spell, frees the slaves, and leaves, and so does Sonic, who says that his exciting life is just the way he likes it. This is what I really like about Sonic. He appreciates being the protagonist of adventures, rather than complaining about it because Boom Sonic. In the next story, Amy and Technor are teleported to a black and white film noir dimension. Oh, like an Archie, only it'll be good because it won't be confused by the heroes somehow acting like they've always lived there. They almost get hit by a limousine, with one of them calling them broads, saying that the town belongs to Mr. Big while trying to shoot at them. Techno is surprised that her scanner is saying that the planet is unpopulated when there's clearly people around. I guess they're all robots, and her scanner is too stupid to tell their people. They find a police officer that Amy was looking forward to finding, though since Amy was looking forward to a cop, I'm sure there will be a twist where he's actually not on their side. The cop mistakes them for some criminals, with someone at a police station calling Amy his sister and asking her where she stashed the diamonds. I hope that there really is an alternate universe Amy and Techno in this dimension, because this comic doesn't do that and instead has boring new characters for all of its new dimensions instead. Which I guess is more realistic, but still. Techno flies Amy out of the window and shows optimism that their situation keeps them occupied. They land in an alley where the detectives being threatened by mobsters. Amy punches one of the mobsters satisfyingly, a part of why I love the Sonic comics, as the villains are humiliated into running away. At just one small girl punching them, yeah that makes sense. The detective says that this isn't how it happens and they shouldn't be here. It's like he was just an actor. Annoyingly, he doesn't even bother to thank them, and a bunch of mobsters sprout out of the sidewalk and windows and walls to threaten them. The story ends with Max Gamble threatening them from his limo. I hope he's an alternate universe version of himself, because that'd make more sense than him somehow traveling to another dimension. But I doubt it because he sticks out like a sore thumb in a gangster film world. In the next story, the soldiers briefly try to arrest Charmy like the other Chaotix, but then they decide to let him leave, underestimating his intelligence. Even though his stupidity is only in the sense that he keeps using a stupid speech tick no one likes and acts ditzy. But he still made a plan to save his friends once, and he isn't shown to be a screw-up of following orders. For some reason, when he's threatened in an alley by Crimson Cobra, he misremembers the name of a cobra as Cobbler. Crimson Cobbler. Just wanting to brag, Cobra tells Charmy that he was the one who turned Vector into a monster and turned Mighty and Espio against each other. I love this whole concept, but should he really be telling him this? Charmy gets hit by a brain scrambler that will drive him insane. Isn't he already kind of insane though? Won't this just cure him? And make him more of a threat to his plans? Logically, he should have just shot him like a real gangster actually would instead of just hoping that Charmy would get himself killed with insanity by himself. Charmy screams for being hit with the brain scrambler that so far has only been shown to be able to enrage people, and later, 
A news report reveals to Cobra that Charmy bought out Crimson Cobra Inc. Then someone reminds the Cobra that Charmy is a millionaire whose mother is the Queen Bee. So yeah, he just went to her, probably. Cobra says in a panic that he can't rule the world without his equipment, which is getting taken from him by his own employees. Charmy then calls Cobra, being pretty awesome here, and says that he just offered to double Cribbon's salary if he agreed to work for him. I love this so much! It's actually taking advantage of the fact that Charmy's from a wealthy family to make them successful in a plot against the villain. I mean, Sally never got to use her wealthy background against the bad guys. Well, well, unless she's the one funding Rotor's invention materials, but that's never elaborated on. He just gets them out of nowhere. But here, Charmy being from a rich family royalty is a check of gun, which is especially impressive because it wasn't nearly as useful in Archie. He went back to his kingdom to be a prince and then lost it all, and that was it. Then, with Charmy near the Chaotix with bars behind them, Charmy tells Cobra over the phone that he's explained everything to the police. So the Chaotix are free again. Good thing the police believed him. And Mighty infuriatingly says that this is the stupidest way of defeating a supervillain he's ever heard of. Oh my god, ugh! He's lucky Charmy's such a good person. Because I could kind of understand if he just didn't save the Chaotix. The only reason he should is to have a stronger villain fighting team. Otherwise, they're such ungrateful assholes every time he does something useful, and they don't even acknowledge it in the slightest. You'd think they'd appreciate his smart plan and moment of awesome, but no! This doesn't make it feel like they have a genuine bond. And then Charmy says that because the Brain Scrambler temporarily drove him insane, that's why he came up with a smart idea. Yeah, no. I'm sticking with the theory that he's insane normally, and the Brain Scrambler just brought him back to normal for a while. It makes way more sense that Dominion's worth like this. If he was truly driven insane, he wouldn't have been able to come up with any good plan at all. He'd just sit there and flail around saying crazy stuff. So there has to be something else going on here that even Charmy's not aware of. Even if he did have something wrong with him naturally, I don't think his mother would have told him about it in the first place at this age. I really hate the fact that the issue ends with trying to have me actually believe that Charmy's driven insane temporarily, when he never would have made a smart plan like that if he was. Also, I guess Charmy had nothing to worry about with the idea that the Chaotix would treat him differently for being a prince, because no, they're still just as abusive to the point where their constant verbal abuse should be alarming child services. Not to mention he's put in dangerous situations in a villain fighting crew all the time, which would do the same thing. But he can fly, and they kind of need him, as a distraction at least. The first story was by Nigel Kitching, and was a one-shot story where Sonic passes out in a sudden sandstorm, from suffocation, I guess. And then Sadis finally breaks out of the slave cells, I wonder where the children he was with went. And he convinces the two-headed slave driver to break him out of the cage, spin dashes at the chest of the sorcerer, and tells him that he can't say his spells faster than he can attack them. This causes the sorcerer to agree to do what he wants, and reverse all the damage he's done. As usual, I like the story, and the interesting new concepts it had. The second story was by Lou Stringer, and had Amy and Techno warped to a black and white Phil Noir dimension of robot people who blame them for a diamond thievery. And when they save a detective from some mobsters, he just complains about them breaking a script. So is this all just a computer program? Why would he care instead of being grateful? Are they all just actors, basically? And in the end, it turns out that it's Max Gamble who's running the dimension because he can teleport to other zones now. So far, this is handling the idea of a film noir dimension much better than Archie, aside from the frustrating aspect of Amy and Techno being framed and chased by the police, a plot point I always hate in fiction. The final story was by Nigel again, it was another fun story where Charmy has a moment of awesome when he's left alone. He's hit with a brain scrambler, but because he's so crazy acting normally, it actually makes him smarter, allowing him to be loose enough to come up with the plan to take advantage of his royal wealth and buy up the company Crimson Cobra gets his stuff from. Unfortunately, the police fortunately believe him about everything and let the Chaotix go. Good thing. But what's not a good thing is the sheer stupidity of Mighty dismissing his plan as stupid, with none of them having any sort of compliments for it whatsoever. This is his crowding moment of awesome, guys! These guys barely even deserve to be saved. He goes out of his way to save them twice, and because he talks like Ned Flanders, because he has some nasty verbal tics, they still hate him. I could only assume they tried to send him to a speech therapist to get him to stop saying stuff like yippee yappy do, but it didn't work. 
or otherwise they would have had the problem solved by now. But could Factor the Lab Genius just make some chip in his brain to brainwash him out of it? Or at least to give him a minor shock every time he talks like that? They all hate him, so they wouldn't mind doing it. That's why speech tech is such a force of comedy, because it shouldn't even exist anymore in the first place. At least the games didn't feel the need to give Charmy that kind of flaw to give the Chaotix an excuse to snark at him, which is usually the only reason they even insult him. The point is, I love Charmy's plan of thinking outside the box, something a truly insane person couldn't have done, they, they wouldn't be able to do anything. And while I hate his weird speech sometimes, he's probably the most lovable of the Chaotix in this comic, because he's still a nice kid who wants to help people who clearly won't appreciate it coming from him. The fact that Fang's the one who betrayed them, and not the one they insult all the time, says a lot about what a good person he is. He teases them occasionally, but that's, but that's not really different than how Sonic would behave to Knuckles. He doesn't even seem too hyperactive, but maybe I'm just not remembering because the story showed him off as not very annoying at all here. 